The Green Fairy Book by Andrew Lang The Golden Mermaid A powerful king had, among many other treasures, a wonderful tree in his garden, which bore every year beautiful golden apples. But the king was never able to enjoy his treasure, for he might watch and guard them as he liked. As soon as they began to get ripe, they were always stolen. At last, in despair, he sent for his three sons, and said to the two eldest, Get yourselves ready for a journey. Take gold and silver with you, and a large retinue of servants, as beseems two noble princes, and go through the world till you find out who it is that steals my golden apples. And if possible, bring the thief to me, that I may punish him as he deserves. His sons were delighted at this proposal, for they had long wished to see something of the world. So they got ready for their journey with all haste, bade their father farewell, and left the town. The youngest prince was much disappointed that he too was not sent out on his travels, but his father wouldn't hear of his going, for he had always been looked upon as the stupid one of the family, and the king was afraid of something happening to him. But the prince begged and implored so long that at last his father consented to let him go, and furnished him with gold and silver as he had done his brothers. But he gave the most wretched horse in the stable, because the foolish youth hadn't asked for a better. So he too set out on his journey to secure the thief, amid the jeers and laughter of the whole court and town. His path led him first through a wood, and he hadn't gone very far when he met a lean-looking wolf who stood still as he approached. The prince asked him if he were hungry, and when the wolf said he was, he got down from his horse and said, If you are really as you say and look, you may take my horse and eat it. The wolf didn't wait to have the offer repeated, but set to work and soon made an end of the poor beast. When the prince saw how different the wolf looked when he had finished his meal, he said to him, Now, my friend, since you have eaten up my horse, and I have such a long way to go, that, with the best will in the world, I couldn't manage it on foot. The least you can do for me is to act as my horse, and to take me on your back. Most certainly said the wolf, and letting the prince mount him, he trotted gaily through the woods. After they had gone a little way, he turned round and asked his rider where he wanted to go, and the prince proceeded to tell him the whole story of the golden apples that had been stolen out of the king's garden, and how his other two brothers had set forth with many followers to find the thief. When he had finished the story, the wolf, who was in reality no wolf but a mighty magician, said he thought he could tell him who the thief was, and could help him to secure him. There lives, he said, in a neighboring country a mighty emperor, who has a beautiful golden bird in a cage. And this is the creature who steals the golden apples, but it flies so fast that it is impossible to catch it at its theft. You must slip into the emperor's palace by night, and steal the bird with the cage, but be very careful not to touch the walls as you go out. The following night the prince stole into the emperor's palace, and found the bird in its cage as the wolf had told him he would. He took hold of it carefully, but in spite of all his caution he touched the wall in trying to pass by some sleeping watchman. They awoke at once, and seizing him, beat him and put him into chains. Next day he was led before the emperor who had once condemned him to death and to be thrown into a dark dungeon till the day of his execution arrived. The wolf, who of course knew by his magic arts all that had happened to the prince, turned himself at once into a mighty monarch with a large train of followers, and proceeded to the court of the emperor where he was received with every show of honor. The emperor and he conversed on many subjects, and among other things, the stranger asked his host if he had many slaves. The emperor told him he had more than he knew what to do with, and that a new one had been captured that very night for trying to steal his magic bird, but that as he had already more than enough to feed and support, he was going to have this last captive hanged next morning. He must have been a most daring thief, said the king to try to steal the magic bird, for depend upon it the creature must have been well guarded. I would really like to see this bold rascal. By all means, said the emperor, 
and he himself led his guests down to the dungeon where the unfortunate prince was kept prisoner. When the emperor stepped out of the cell with the king, the latter turned to him and said, Most mighty emperor, I have been much disappointed. I had thought to find a powerful robber, and instead of that I have seen the most miserable creature I can imagine. Hanging is far too good for him. If I had to sentence him, I should make him perform some very difficult task under pain of death. If he did it, so much the better for you, and if he didn't, matters would just be as they are now, and he could still be hanged. Your counsel, said the emperor, is excellent, and as it happens, I've got the very thing for him to do. My nearest neighbor, who is also a mighty emperor, possesses a golden horse which he guards most carefully. The prisoner shall be told to steal this horse and bring it to me. The prince was then let out of his dungeon, and told his life would be spared if he succeeded in bringing the golden horse to the emperor. He did not feel very elated at this announcement, for he did not know how in the world he was to set about the task, and he started on his way weeping bitterly, and wondering what had made him leave his father's house and kingdom. But before he had gone far, his friend the wolf stood before him and said, Dear Prince, why are you so cast down? It is true you didn't succeed in catching the bird, but don't let that discourage you, for this time you will be all the more careful, and will doubtless catch the horse. With these and like words, the wolf comforted the Prince, and warned him specially not to touch the wall or let the horse touch it as he was let out, or he would fail in the same way as he had done with the bird. After a somewhat lengthy journey, the prince and the wolf came to the kingdom, ruled over by the emperor who possessed the golden horse. One evening late they reached the capital. The wolf advised the prince to set to work at once, before their presence in the city had aroused the watchfulness of the guards. They slipped unnoticed into the emperor's stable, and into the very place where there were the most guards, for there the wolf rightly surmised they would find the horse. When they came to a certain inner door, the wolf told the prince to remain outside while he went in. In a short time he returned and said, My dear prince, the horse is most securely watched, but I have bewitched all the guards, and if you will only be careful not to touch the wall yourself or let the horse touch it as you go out, there is no danger and the game is yours. The prince, who had made up his mind to be more than cautious this time, went cheerfully to work. He found all the guards fast asleep, and slipping into the horse's stall, he seized it by the bridle and let it out. But unfortunately, before they had got quite clear of the stables, a gadfly stung the horse and caused it to switch its tail, whereby it touched the wall. In a moment, all the guards awoke, seized the prince, and beat him mercilessly with their horse whips, after which they bound him with chains and flung him into a dungeon. Next morning they brought him before the emperor, who treated him exactly as the king with the golden bird had done, and commanded him to be beheaded on the following day. When the wolf magician saw that the prince had failed this time too, he transformed himself again into a mighty king and proceeded with an even more gorgeous retinue than the first time to the court of the emperor. He was courteously received and entertained, and once more after dinner he led the conversation on to the subject of slaves, and in the course of it again requested to be allowed to see the bold robber who had dared to break into the emperor's stable to steal his most valuable possession. The emperor consented, and all happened exactly as it had done at the court of the emperor with the golden bird. The prisoner's life was to be spared only on condition that within three days he should obtain possession of the golden mermaid, whom hitherto no mortal had ever approached. Very depressed by his dangerous and difficult task, the prince left his gloomy prison, but to his great joy he met his friend the wolf before he had gone many miles on his journey. The cunning creature pretended he knew nothing of what had happened to the prince, and asked him how he had fared with the horse. 
The prince told him all about his misadventure, and the condition on which the emperor had promised to spare his life. Then the wolf reminded him that he had twice got him out of prison, and that if he would only trust in him and do exactly as he told him, he would certainly succeed in this last undertaking. Thereupon they bent their steps towards the sea, which stretched out before them as far as their eyes could see, all the waves dancing and glittering in the bright sunshine. Now, continued the wolf, I am going to turn myself into a boat full of the most beautiful silken merchandise, and you must jump boldly into the boat and steer with my tail in your hand right out into the open sea. You will soon come upon the golden mermaid. Whatever you do, don't follow her if she calls you. But on the contrary, say to her, The buyer comes to the seller, not the seller to the buyer. After which you must steer towards land, and she will follow you, for she won't be able to resist the beautiful wares you have on board your ship. The prince promised faithfully to do all he had been told, whereupon the wolf changed himself into a ship full of the most exquisite silks of every shape and color imaginable. The astonished prince stepped into the boat, and holding the wolf's tail in his hand, he steered boldly out into the open sea where the sun was gilding the blue waves with its golden rays. Soon he saw the golden mermaid swimming near the ship, beckoning and calling him to follow her. But mindful of the wolf's warning, he told her in a loud voice that if she wished to buy anything, she must come to him. With these words, he turned his magic ship round and steered back towards the land. The mermaid called out to him to stand still, but he refused to listen to her and never paused till he reached the sand of the shore. Here he stopped and waited for the mermaid, who had swum after him. When she drew near the boat, he saw that she was far more beautiful than any mortal he had ever beheld. She swam round the ship for some time, and then swung herself gracefully on board in order to examine the beautiful silken stuffs more closely. Then the prince seized her in his arms, and kissing her tenderly on the cheeks and lips, he told her she was his forever. At the same time the boat turned into a wolf again which so terrified the mermaid that she clung to the prince for protection. So the golden mermaid was successfully caught, and she soon felt quite happy in her new life when she saw she had nothing to fear, either from the prince or the wolf. She rode on the back of the ladder, and the prince rode behind her. When they reached the country ruled over by the emperor with the golden horse, the prince jumped down, and helping the mermaid to alight, he led her to the emperor. At the sight of the beautiful mermaid and of the grim wolf, who stuck close to the prince this time, the guards all made respectful obeisance, and soon the three stood before his imperial majesty. When the emperor heard from the prince how he had gained possession of his fair prize, he at once recognized that he had been helped by some magic art, and on the spot gave up all claim to the beautiful mermaid. Dear youth, he said, Forgive me for my shameful conduct to you, and as a sign that you pardon me, accept the golden horse as a present. I acknowledge your power to be greater even than I can understand, for you have succeeded in gaining possession of the golden mermaid, whom hitherto no mortal has ever been able to approach. Then they all sat down to a huge feast, and the prince had to relate his adventure all over again to the wonder and astonishment of the whole company. But the prince was wearying now to return to his own kingdom, so as soon as the feast was over he took farewell of the emperor and set out on his homeward way. He lifted the mermaid onto the golden horse and swung himself up behind her, and so they rode on merrily, with the wolf trotting behind, till they came to the country of the emperor with the golden bird. The renown of the prince and his adventures had gone before him and the emperor sat on his throne, awaiting the arrival of the prince and his companions. When the three rode into the courtyard of the palace, they were surprised and delighted to find everything festively illuminated and decorated for the reception. When the prince and the golden mermaid, with the wolf behind them, mounted the steps of the palace, the emperor came forward to meet them and led them to the throne room. 
At the same moment a servant appeared with the golden bird in its golden cage, and the emperor begged the prince to accept it with his love and to forgive him the indignity he had suffered at his hands. Then the emperor bent low before the beautiful mermaid, and offering her his arm, he led her into dinner, closely followed by the prince and her friend the wolf, the latter seating himself at the table, not the least embarrassed that no one had invited him to do so. As soon as the sumptuous meal was over, the prince and his mermaid took leave of the emperor, and seating themselves on the golden horse, continued their homeward journey. On the way the wolf turned to the prince and said, Dear friends, I must now bid you farewell, but I leave you under such happy circumstances that I cannot feel our parting will be a sad one. The prince was very unhappy when he heard these words, and begged the wolf to stay with them always. But this the good creature refused to do, though he thanked the prince kindly for his invitation, and called out as he disappeared into the thicket, Should any evil befall you, dear prince, at any time, you may rely on my friendship and gratitude. These were the wolf's parting words and the prince could not restrain his tears when he saw his friend vanishing in the distance, but one glance at his beloved mermaid soon cheered him up again, and they continued their journey merrily. The news of his son's adventures had already reached his father's court, and everyone was more astonished at the success of the once despised prince. His elder brothers, who had in vain gone in pursuit of the thief of the golden apples, were furious over their younger brother's good fortune, and plotted and planned how they were to kill him. They hid themselves in the wood through which the prince had to pass on his way to the palace, and there fell on him, and having beaten him to death, they carried off the golden horse and the golden bird, but nothing they could do would persuade the golden mermaid to go with them or move from the spot forever since she had left the sea she had so attached herself to the prince that she had nothing else than to live or die with him for many weeks the poor mermaid sat and watched over the dead body of her lover weeping salt tears over his loss when suddenly one day their old friend the wolf appeared and said Cover the prince's body with all the leaves and flowers you can find in the wood. The maiden did as he told her, and then the wolf breathed over the flowery grave, and lo and behold, the prince lay there sleeping as peacefully as a child. Now you may wake him if you like, said the wolf. And the mermaid bent over him and gently kissed the wounds his brothers had made on his forehead. And the prince awoke, and you may imagine how delighted he was to find his beautiful mermaid beside him, though he felt a little depressed when he thought of the loss of the golden bird and the golden horse. After a time the wolf, who had likewise fallen on the prince's neck, advised them to continue their journey, and once more the prince and his lovely bride mounted on the faithful beast's back. The king's joy was great when he embraced his youngest son, for he had long since despaired of his return. He received the wolf and the beautiful golden mermaid most cordially, too, and the prince was made to tell his adventures all over from the beginning. The poor old father grew very sad when he heard of the shameful conduct of his elder sons, and had them called before him. They turned as white as death when they saw their brother, whom they thought they had murdered, standing beside them, alive and well. And so startled were they that when the king asked them why they had behaved so wickedly to their brother, they could think of no lie, but confessed at once that they had slain the young prince in order to obtain possession of the golden horse and the golden bird. Their father's wrath knew no bounds, and he ordered them both to be banished, but he could not do enough to honor his youngest son, and his marriage with the beautiful mermaid was celebrated with much pomp and magnificence. When the festivities were over, the wolf bade them all farewell, and returned once more to his life in the woods much to the regret of the old king and the young prince and his bride. So ended the adventures of the prince with his friend the wolf, Grimm. End of The Golden Mermaid Recording by Elizabeth Saranka